now. Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 9. Got a lot of material to cover this morning, and so we're going to uh, just get into it and do it. And uh, hopefully the Lord will speak to our hearts through it. But we're going to cover this entire chapter this morning, and if you've read it ahead of time, you know that it's one you know, long thought from the Apostle Paul, and just didn't seem right to to divide it up, so I thought we'll just take it all together. We're not going to read it in, uh, all in our congregational reading. We'll read verses 1 to 8, and then verses 30 to 33. So let's stand together, and uh, I'll read the first verse and, and the alternate verses, and you guys can join in in reading the other ones. Uh, you guys will start with verse 2. So Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. When I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. And then moving ahead to verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So, Father, we come to you now and we ask that your spirit would guide us and lead us into all truth this morning. Your word is truth. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There are a number of people in the world today who believe in fate or destiny. Merriam-Webster defines fate as the will or the principle or determining cause by which things in general are believed to come to be as they are, or events to happen as they do. Dictionary.com says it's something that unavoidably befalls a person, fortune or lot. A second definition they give is it's the universal principle or ultimate agency by which the order of things is presumably prescribed the decreed cause of events, time. Some definitions indicate that it's similar to the term predestination. Whether ordered by a higher power or not, fate being a force in and of itself. I read a story this week that some, somewhat illustrates this. Four expectant fathers were in Minnesota... In a, in a hospital in Minnesota, and they were in the waiting room while their wives were in labor, all four of them at the same time. The nurse comes in and she tells the first man, congratulations, you're the father of twins. Oh, what a coincidence, the man says. 
I work for the Minnesota Twins baseball team. The nurse returns a short while later, and she tells the second man, you're the father of triplets. What a coincidence, the guy says. I work for the 3M Corporation. When the nurse comes again, she tells the third man that his wife has given birth to quadruplets. What a coincidence, he tells her. I work for the Four Seasons Hotel. At this point, the fourth guy, he just faints and he falls over onto the floor. And when he comes to, the others ask him what, what was wrong. He says, I work for 7-Eleven. <laughs> so this guy apparently was pretty certain that fate was going to grab him because there were just too many coincidences there happening all at once, right? Well, some people view God's plan for mankind in a similar sort of fashion. And though there is no doubt from Scripture that God has predestined certain things to happen to each of us, I don't believe that everything is predestined. God has put us in a world and he's given us the ability to choose between right and wrong. He has enabled us with wills that are free to choose between good and bad. But more importantly, we are free to choose between faith and unbelief. We are free to choose between believing and trusting in God or believing and trusting in ourselves. I do not believe that our decision to believe or to not believe is governed by any form of fate or predestination. What we do with our wills is up to us. And how God responds to what we do with our wills is up to him. And ultimately, he will have the last word. Thus, the importance of responding to God in faith. And that's why I titled the message today, The Importance of Responding to God in Faith. Paul has shared some beautiful things with the Christians in Rome, and they also apply to us. We've been rescued, Paul says, from the body of death in chapter 7, verses 24 to 25. He says there is no longer any condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus in chapter 8, verse 1. We can now live lives that are no longer controlled by the flesh, but that are controlled by the Spirit in chapter 8, verse 9. We are God's adopted children, and we are heirs of God's glory in chapter 8, verses 17 to 18. And God is working out everything for our good, according to Romans 8, 28. And God is for us to the extent that no one can prevail against us in chapter 8, verse 31. And nothing or no one can separate us from God's love in chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. But what about the Jews, God's chosen? They are God's chosen. Didn't he make promises to them? Didn't he promise to bless them forever? And so some would say, has God failed? Has God failed? And, and by, by way of application to us, will that happen to us as well? Will, will God's promises to us fail? Well, I think chapters 9 to 11 deal with these issues. And the first thing that we see here is that Paul expresses his sorrow over the current lost spiritual state of most of those who are in Israel. We'll see that in these first five verses. And certainly one of the takeaways that I get from this is that we should have, just like Paul, as Paul had a deep concern for his people and their salvation, I think that we should have a deep, deep, deep concern for the lost of our time. And not just for the lost generally, but for the lost 
who are within our sphere of influence. We can't reach everyone in the world with the gospel, but we can reach the ones that we come in contact with every day. But sad to say, I'm afraid that we often don't think at all about the lost of our day. Paul had a deep sorrow for his fellow countrymen's lost state. And that, I believe, is where our attempts to share the gospel need to begin. They need to begin in sorrow and in prayer. And Paul would have, he'd been willing to sacrifice anything, including his own salvation, if it would help his fellow Israelites to be saved. Look at verse 1. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying, I haven't made this up. All that I've said up to this point is true. And then he goes on in verse 2. He says that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. I think Paul is being perfectly honest here about his feelings. He's being very transparent. He doesn't have sour grapes toward the Jews. If anybody seemed to have a right to have sour grapes, it would be Paul. Everywhere that Paul went in his journeys, he went first into the synagogues to his brethren, the Jews, trying to tell them the truth so that they could be saved. And when he did this, most of them hated him for it. And some of them sought to kill him. Nevertheless, he says he has great sorrow and continual grief in his heart for the Jews. This is amazing when you think about it. I think it's even uh, superhuman almost. While most people would curse those who sought to kill them, Paul had only sorrow and grief for his persecutors. Maybe instead of wishing ill upon our detractors, we could ask God to give us sorrow and grief for them. As Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And of course, you all know that was while he was hanging on the cross, suffering for our sins. But Paul doesn't have just grief and sorrow for his persecutors. He takes it to a whole new level. Look at verse 3. He said, For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Maybe instead of, of well, let's put it this way. I don't think any, any of us would legitimately say that we would be willing to give up our salvation so that another might be saved. Now, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there's someone here, one or two, who would be willing to do that. I, I, honestly, I don't think I would be. I'm just being honest with you there. But, but this, is, this is Paul. And when you, when you look back into the Old Testament, you see that it's completely reminiscent of Moses. In Exodus chapter 32, Moses had been up on Mount Sinai getting the law of God from God himself. I mean, he was, he was in direct communication with God. And the people of Israel, while this is taking place, were down at the bottom of the mountain and they were worshiping a golden calf. God was not pleased, to say the least, with Israel. He told Moses to leave him alone, and that his wrath uh, would burn hot against them and consume them. But Moses interceded for the people, even though they deserved nothing but God's judgment at the time. We're told in Exodus 32, verse 31, Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin... And then he says this, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. Isn't that amazing? 
Both of these men, Paul and Moses, were more than remarkable. Both of them would have been willing to take the punishment that their fellow Israelites deserved. This is second only to Jesus himself, who did take the punishment that each of us deserve. We all know this verse, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And until we find this kind of love for those around us, I'm afraid that our desire to reach them with the gospel will at best be subdued and at worst be in word only. Paul begins now to speak about the many privileges that had been given to the Jews as God's chosen people. Privileges that should have inspired their devotion to him, but didn't. The people of Israel were given many, many privileges uh, regarding knowing Jesus, who is, uh, Paul says, God deserving of praise. But they rejected those privileges and their meaning. Look at verse 4. He says, starts off with the list. He says, um, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Now let's, let's talk about this list of things for just a few moments. First thing on the list was who are Israelites? Who are Israelites? To be called an Israelite was very, very important. Uh, so Paul says, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. Now Israel was God's adopted son according to Exodus 4.22. God was a father to Israel and he loved them more than any father would. But now the next privilege is every bit as wonderful. First, they're Israelites. Second, they're adopted sons. But third, they saw the glory, the glory of God. The Israelites saw the glory of God in the wilderness. Exodus 16.10. King David speaks about seeing the glory of God and his power in the sanctuary in Psalm 63.2. The glory of the Lord. This is the presence of God. The very presence of God filled the temple during the time of Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7.3. Who else had seen God's glory and lived to tell about it? Well, maybe Moses did. We're, we're sure Moses did. Uh, Aaron did, probably. Joshua did. But not many more than that. Some say if, if they could just see God, they would believe. Well, these guys did see God in, in his glory. They didn't, you know... I don't think they looked at his face or anything like that. But they saw his glory. That's his presence. They saw him. But they didn't believe. If they did initially, it didn't last long. So, if you think that if you would just see God, that that would just solve all of your problems, don't count on it. Don't count on it. There, there were several generations of Israelites who saw God's glory. This just didn't happen in one specific period of time, you know, the time of Moses. But several generations of Israelites saw the glory of God from the time of Moses going forward. But they chose to reject him anyway. The glory, it's a big deal. Next Next privilege, the covenants, the covenants. They were given to Abraham in Genesis 17. They were given to Isaac in Genesis 26. They were given to Jacob in Genesis 28. All three of these Jewish fathers had heard from God personally. God personally spoke to them. And he made specific commitments to each of them, Deuteronomy 10, 15. 
That brings us to the giving of the law. No other nation was given the law. Only Israel was given the law. Psalm 147, verse 19. But then they were also given, beyond the law, they were given the service of God. In other words, the ability to conduct the worship of God in the temple. This is summarized in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. God gave them this tremendous privilege of serving him. What an honor. No one else on earth was given this honor. We should consider it an honor to serve God, to worship him. And then he gave them the promises, it says there in verse 4. Certainly the most amazing of these promises were those concerning the coming of the Messiah who would die for the sins of the world. And probably the most remarkable of those promises is found in, in Isaiah chapter 53. Go back and read it in your spare time. God would bring forth the Messiah of the entire world, not just the Jews, but the entire world through one of their descendants. He would give them worldwide influence. He would give them an eternal impact as people could be saved from their sins by just trusting in this Messiah, Messiah who would come as a descendant of David. Israel also had the privilege of being the place where the major part of salvation history began. He says, of whom are the fathers? The most significant of these fathers, obviously, were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We hear of them throughout the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God had chosen them above all peoples, as Moses says in Deuteronomy 10, 15. What a privilege, what a privilege. Of all the people groups on the planet at the time that Moses, I'm sorry, that Abraham's family lived, God chose Abraham. He singled out Abraham to bless the world. Continuing on to the next blessing. And from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Jesus was a Jew. Mary was his mother. Certainly Abraham knew how blessed he was to be chosen by God. Probably Isaac and Jacob knew as well eventually. But from there on, most of the Jews didn't know or they took God's blessing for granted. But not many years later, I'm sorry, but many years later, not Mary. She didn't take it for granted. She wrote one of the most beautiful songs in the world, praising God for what he had done in her life. Joseph didn't take the blessing of God for granted, nor did Zechariah and Elizabeth, nor the shepherds, nor Simeon, nor Anna, certainly not John the Baptist. None of these contemporaries of Jesus took God's blessing for granted. Hopefully we aren't taking God's blessing for granted. And now the ultimate privilege Paul says there at the end of verse 5, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. What's he saying there? God lived with them. God lived with them. He's talking about Jesus when he says, who is over all the eternally blessed God. That's Jesus. This is no doubt one of the clearest claims to the deity of Christ in the entire Bible. Who is over all? Jesus. Jesus is over all. He is the eternally blessed God. And guess what? He dwelt with them. He lived with them. Can there be a greater privilege than that? What a blessing. What a tremendous blessing. And Paul clearly says here that the Messiah is overall the eternally blessed God. Or as the NIV 
translates it, the Messiah who is God over all forever praised. That's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? It's one of the clearest claims to Jesus being God in the New Testament. So then, what happened? Why had the Jews rejected God and his Messiah? What went wrong? Says Paul, from God's perspective, nothing went wrong. The problem has always and always will be not with God, but with man. God did everything right. Now Paul continues his thesis. Even though most in Israel rejected the promises of God regarding the Messiah, that didn't mean that God's promises or his word had failed. You see, God's promises are not dependent on whether a certain ethnic group believes and submits to them. Look at verse 6. He says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. Now notice, the names of Abraham and Israel were names of significance given by God. Abram's, Abraham's original name was Abram, father. But Abraham means father of many nations. Israel means soldier of God or governed by God. So these names... These were names that God gave to Abraham and Jacob, who Abraham, uh, or God renamed Israel. And Isaac has, is an interesting name too. And when you take first look at it, you don't think there's much significance to it other than, you know, what happened uh, when, you know, his birth was being announced. It means he laughs. Isaac, he laughs or he will laugh. The Bible seems to indicate that Isaac's name uh, comes from the fact that both Abraham and Sarah laughed at the thought of having a child in their old age. If you read back in the book of Genesis, it looks like Sarah laughed because she didn't believe it. She thought it was the idea was preposterous. Abraham laughed, I think, out of joy. So Sarah was rebuked. Abraham was not. But maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe the idea that God has given certain promises to those who trust in him should cause a bit of laughter on our part too. I'm speaking about the laughter of joy. The physical lineage of Israel is not the primary concern. The real descendants of Israel have what we might call the spiritual lineage of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We have that in common with them. All three of them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, came to a point in their lives that they surrendered to God and they became his soldiers or his servants, meaning that they had surrendered themselves to his authority in their lives. They were willing to do what God wanted and they believed without wavering that God would fulfill his promises to them. And so from that we learn that the people who believe the promises of God, like Abraham did, are the people who qualify as the descendants of Abraham, just as Isaac did and Jacob did, but not Ishmael or Esau, though they were all descendants of Abraham. Look at verse 8. He says, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. In other words, those who believe in the promises of God are the ones who are regarded as descendants of Abraham, whether they're Jews or not. He goes on in verse 9 and he says, For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Now, Abraham believed this promise. 
his real descendants, who are also God's children, will be those who believe God's promises. And that's essentially what Paul is saying here. Verse 10, he says, But not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now this is, this is a difficult passage, and so I want to take a moment here and consider this. A lot of, lot of theological controversy has arisen among Christians about this passage. And for those of you who are familiar with the controversy regarding the doctrines of election, predestination, and the sovereignty of God, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm I'm going to be able to resolve this controversy. We just don't have enough time for it. We would probably need to spend several weeks talking about each of the doctrines. But maybe uh, the comments that I offer you today will offer some help to you if, if you are concerned about these things. Maybe they won't. I'm just going to take a few minutes and I'm going to try to give you the point of view that I've settled on as I have wrestled with these issues over my almost 50 years of being a Christian. More specifically, I'm going to try and teach what I believe this passage is telling us after I've compared it to other verses over the years that seem to address similar issues. For those of you not familiar with the controversy, then maybe I can spare you the anguish of having to deal with these issues in the future. Some very, very large books have been written about these issues. And so if you'd like some further study sources, I'll be happy to share them with you. But I'm telling you, they're very large books, and you'll be spending probably the rest of your life trying to digest them. But nevertheless, if you're willing, I'll, I'll share with you, okay? This passage is speaking, though, very specifically about Jacob and Esau. That's the focus, Jacob and Esau. God had chosen Jacob to be the one who the promises of God for the world would come through. Just as God had chosen Abraham, and then he chose Isaac, and then he chose Jacob, but he didn't choose Esau. And he didn't choose Jacob because Jacob was a wonderful guy and he had consistent good works and he had a lifetime of faithfulness to God. We're told that God called Jacob to be the one that he would use. And the reason simply is not given. We don't know why. God doesn't tell us why he chose Jacob over Esau. But God, before either one of them was born, called Jacob to be the one who he would fulfill his promises through and he didn't call Esau. Now that doesn't mean that he condemned Esau before he was born. It doesn't say that. It just means that he chose Jacob. He called Jacob. It says that Jacob was chosen for a specific purpose. He would be the one who would lead the family forward and through whom God would bring the Messiah. He would choose uh, Judah as well, Jacob, one of Jacob's sons for this purpose. Judah was not a particularly good guy either. Uh, he was the fourth son of Jacob from his wife Leah. And then, and then God would choose Perez, one of the sons born to Judah from the adulterous relationship that he had with his daughter-in-law. And then on down the line, from Perez to Hezron to Ram to Abinadab to Nation to Salmon to Boaz to Obed to Jesse to King David, and on down the line to Jesus. You can read the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Now some of the guys mentioned, some were good, some were bad. But God chose them all, or he elected 
them all to accomplish his purposes, not because of their goodness and certainly not because of their badness, but because of their place in the lineage of the Messiah. That's really it. This is one of the ways that this idea of election or being chosen is used in the Bible. God can choose both future believer or unbeliever to accomplish his purposes without regard to their salvation. He's decreed certain things that he wants them to do, and in that decree, he will arrange the various circumstances in their lives to get them in a position where they will want to do those things, and he does that without violating their wills. That's the case with these guys, particularly with Jacob and Esau. And they are the, are the only ones in question here in this passage of Romans. Now, I think it's ill-advised to take what God says here concerning Jacob's election by God to this purpose and apply it to everyone. This passage isn't saying this applies to everyone. And yet many other passages do refer to believers in Jesus generally as the elect. Also, the descendants of Jacob are referred to as the elect in several passages in the Old Testament. I think it's, it's clear in pretty much all of the passages, and I've looked at almost all of them. I can't say 100% all of them, but I've looked at almost all of them, and it's pretty clear that much of the passages uh, that are where people are referred to as the elect are those who are following after the Lord, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament. The elect in this sense, I think, are believers and only believers. From this I take it that God chooses or elects know, those that he knows in his foreknowledge will believe in Jesus in the fullest sense. Or in the case of the Old Testament, those who would accept by faith the promises of God and seek to serve God and others in humility. Though most Jews did not do this, there were many who did. And he'll refer to them in a little bit as the remnant. So these, these are the ones that when God speaks of the elect in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I believe that he's speaking of those who he knows are going to believe in Christ. There are many who believe that God has decreed beforehand and that he's chosen those who would believe in Jesus and be saved without regard to what they do or don't do. And if that's true, as one of the professors that I had in college, Dr. Walter Martin used to say, then he would be responsible for sending countless people to hell for all eternity, regardless of what they did or didn't do, because he didn't choose them to believe and to be saved. I have a tough time accepting that, that, that God chooses some to, be, to believe and to be saved, and he doesn't choose others. And if he didn't choose them, then they have no chance of being saved. I have a tough time with that. What makes more sense to me and what I think is more in line with man's responsibility in making his own decision to believe in Jesus is that in his sovereignty, God has given man mankind the freedom to believe or not to believe. And then based on what mankind does with that freedom, he decides to either save them or not. God knows beforehand the decision that we will make because he is omniscient. He is omniscient. But just because he is omniscient and can know beforehand what our decision will be, it doesn't logically follow that he has decreed it to be so. God definitely knows everything past, present, and future. But just because God knows what the future holds, including every decision that everyone will ever make, it doesn't logically follow that he decreed it at all. Because if he decreed it, 
That's essentially the same as fate. But only God controlled fate. See? So people who think that every decision that I make is all kind of scripted out, and who believe in God, they believe that God did that. There's a problem there in my mind. And maybe it's my mind that is the problem, rather than the problem in my mind. But it's one that I have a tough time getting through. The idea of knowing beforehand without decreeing, I think, is the sense in which Paul uses the term foreknew in Romans 8.29. He says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Here the word foreknew means to either know beforehand or to decree beforehand. But since the word predestined means essentially the same thing, if you check your your Greek scholars on this, you'll find that this is true. They're two different Greek words, but they mean essentially the same thing. It's hard to imagine that Paul would be saying that for whom he decreed beforehand, he also decreed beforehand to be conformed to the image of his son. It makes more sense to me that Paul was saying that those he knew beforehand would believe in Jesus. He also decreed beforehand to be conformed to the image of his son. And this, I think, is not the same thing as choosing to believe in Jesus. Only we can choose to believe in Jesus. And choosing to believe or having faith is not a work that any of us can take credit for. The people who have a problem with, with, with my particular point of view on this say that, that if, if we take credit for our belief in Jesus, then essentially that is a work and that, you know, then gr- salvation is no longer by grace, but it's by this one work that I have done that is the work to believe in Jesus. Well, I, I don't think that 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 necessarily follows logically either. Romans 12.3 says that God has distributed a certain amount of faith to everyone. So you can't take credit for your faith even. You can't take credit for it, and I don't believe that God will force us to utilize the faith, the faith that he gives us, because forced faith is not faith at all. Does that make sense? In the same way that forced love is not really love. Forced faith is not faith at all. If you don't have a choice whether to believe or not to believe, then essentially that's forced faith. If we are to be held responsible for our choices, whether good or bad, then we must be free to make those choices. So our choice to believe in Jesus must be unhindered for it to have any meaning. It must be a choice that we make without being forced or determined beforehand by someone or anyone else. Now, choosing to accept Jesus as your Savior, I believe, is essentially the same as choosing to receive a gift. There is no merit in choosing to receive a gift. Does that make sense? If you get a gift from somebody else, you can't pat yourself on the back and say, oh, I received a gift. That doesn't make any sense, does it? You might pat the giver of the gift on the back and say, thank you for giving me this gift. But you can't give yourself any credit by you receiving the gift. And so the doctrine of election, I think, isn't saying that God has chosen those who will believe in Jesus. I think it's saying that for those who do believe in Jesus, God will grant salvation to them. He elects or he chooses them to be saved. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to save anyone, but he chooses to save those who will believe in his son. 
But now let's look at verse 13 and try to unravel it because it has, has been a source of problem for uh, more than a few. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now this is a quote from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. Many commentators believe that since Malachi wrote this some 1,400 years after Jacob and Esau lived, that he was referring more to the descendants of Jacob and Esau or the nations that came from them, namely the nation of Israel. And you know the descendants of Esau became the nation of Edom. So what does this mean? Did God really hate Esau or Edom in the same sense that we think of hate, which is to detest, to abhor, to loathe? Well, the word for hate here is the same word that Jesus used in the gospel according to Luke, verse 14, 26, where it says there, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, granted, that's another verse that some people have problems with. What is he talking about? You mean I can't be a Christian unless I hate my mother and father? Well, here the word hate, and this is important to, to dig into the, the original language, a little bit to figure this out. Here the word hate, according to the complete word study dictionary, which is a, a dictionary that uh, does word studies on all of the Hebrew and Greek words in the Bible. Here these uh, Greek scholars say that this word for hate means to love less, to love less. Here's what it says. Let me read to you what it says. It says, Every member of man's family is a human being. And the love shown to humans compared to the love shown to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, must be so different that the former seems like hatred. The meaning of Maseo as loving less is made clear in Matthew 10.37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And it, the reading goes on. It says, in his commands for loving other human beings, the Lord never said, love other human beings as you love me but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When it comes to loving God, however, he is placed in a unique position. So the love that we have or should have for God should be so much more than the love that we have for each other that it looks like hate on a scale. Now, it's not hate. You know, we don't despise our mother or father. We don't loathe them or our children. But comparatively speaking, the love that we have for God should be way, 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 way more than the love that we have for people on this earth. Another way to look at this, according to the Holman New Testament commentary, is that God preferred Jacob and did not prefer Esau in the same way that Jacob preferred his wife Rachel over his wife Leah. Now, you know that that's true, right? I mean, we know that when Jacob decided he wanted to get married, he fell in love with Rachel. But he ended up first with Leah. Wasn't his first choice. He preferred Rachel. But he took Leah as his wife in submission to his father-in-law and the custom of the day. And then later on, he was also able to marry Rachel. But, but see, he, he didn't hate Leah. He preferred Rachel over Leah. He didn't hate her as in detest her or poor. He had seven kids with her, right? So he didn't hate her. That's pretty clear. But he preferred Rachel for his own reasons. 
and God preferred Israel or, or Jacob over Esau for his own reasons. Namely, he decided to bring salvation to the world by starting with Israel and not with Edom. Paul says it was in order that God's purpose in election might stand, verse 11. So I think this is a reasonable way to look at this. But Paul anticipates that some will object, and this brings us to the next point. God is still just and righteous, though he decides to choose some to accomplish his purposes and not others. And his first point is God's choice is always a righteous choice. Look at verse 14. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs but of God who shows mercy. In other words, who can really argue God's right to do this? God is the creator. He is sovereign. He can do this if he wants to, and he doesn't have to answer to anybody, especially us, for his decisions. But we can take comfort in knowing that God is also good, and God is loving. His goodness and his love guides his power and his sovereignty. Therefore, he is not arbitrary in his choices. He has a good and a loving and also a righteous reason for everything that he does, and so he decides who he will have mercy and compassion on. But again, we must separate man's believing in Jesus from God's decision to save those who will believe. They're, they're two separate things. God's salvation is dependent on his compassion and his mercy, not on man's belief. Man's belief is based on his free will. God's calling, election, and choosing is to salvation, not to belief. God has call, chosen to call and to choose and to elect only those who will believe. Next we see that God chose Moses over Pharaoh. Look at verse 17. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now God didn't create Pharaoh just to wipe him out. When it says God raised him up for this very purpose, it's referring to the place of prominence that God had given him in the world so that the world might see how God will deal with all who rebel and particularly with those who seek to harm the ones that God has chosen to bless. God knew how Pharaoh would respond, so he sovereignly placed him so that everyone would see. Verse 18, therefore it says, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. And God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Yes, he did. But only after Pharaoh had hardened his own heart many, many times. There's a list of scriptures there where it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. It isn't until you get to Exodus chapter 10 that we're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I think this means that God gave Pharaoh over to his hard heart in the same way that he gave others up to their uncleanness, their vile passions and their debased minds in Romans chapter 1, verse 24 to 26. Since these people were determined to do these things, and since Pharaoh was determined to do these things, God gave them up to them, and, and, and this is what he did with Pharaoh. Now again, Paul anticipates an objection here, which brings us to the next point in the outline. Mankind has no right to challenge God in any of the choices that God makes. Look at this, verse 19. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? 
But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? And this is really the bottom line. <laughs> Paul is not ashamed to, to present it this way. He's essentially saying, who, who is man to talk back to God? Who are you and I to, to tell God that he's not doing it right or that he could do it better? Who is man to think that he can tell the creator how to run the universe that he created? This would be what the Jews would call the height of chutzpah. Chutzpah is shameless audacity. It's arrogance. It's gall. It's impudence. Look at verse 21. He says, does the potter have power over the clay? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now, now this is hypothetical here. I think, it's, I think it's wrong to take it any other way. It's hypothetical. Paul isn't saying that God actually created certain vessels so that he could disgrace them. He's just saying that if he did, who do we think we are to challenge him? We would have no basis for a challenge because we don't have all the facts. God has reasons for doing things that he doesn't reveal to anyone. And yet, because God is righteous, he has a good reason for doing everything that he does, even if you and I don't understand it. The only way anyone could have standing to maybe challenge God would be if they had all knowledge and all wisdom. In other words, if they were omniscient themselves. But only God is omniscient. So no one really qualifies to challenge God, right? And yet God decides to go ahead and create and let live those that he knows will not believe and rebel to show that he has patience and to give meaning to the belief of those who do accept Christ. And so Paul continues. God chooses to show mercy to some and to bring judgment to others. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? God also needed to show the severity of sin's consequences. But he waited and he waited with great long suffering, with great patience, showing his great love. They were vessels of wrath, not because God made them that way, but because they made themselves that way. Again, the complete word study dictionary affirms that this phrase means that these unsaved persons prepared or fitted themselves for destruction. God didn't do it. They did it themselves. Verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So do you see the the difference between verse 22 and verse 23. In verse 22, the vessels of wrath prepared themselves for destruction, as the Greek text indicates. But in verse 23, the vessels of mercy, God prepared for glory. And he includes in that group both Jews and Gentiles. And that, then he gives the example from Hosea. Verse 25, he says, he says he, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who is not beloved and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. So those who were at one time estranged from God because of sin will be reunited with him because of his mercy, both Jew and Gentile. That's what Hosea is saying there. And then he gives the example of Isaiah in verse 27. He says, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, 
the remnant will be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And here Israel or Isaiah is prophesying that even though God has chosen the nation of Israel to bless the world, there's really only a small number of them who would. He speaks of the remnant, this small number out of the vast number who would respond to God's mercy and seek to fulfill God's plan to use them to bring the gospel to the world. But Isaiah says that even though the vast majority of the Jews will not fulfill God's calling on them, God would still accomplish his will through the few who would. Verse 29, and as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Unless the Lord had decided to save the few Jews who did believe, the Jews would have been utterly wiped out. Now, after talking about all that God has done in saving man through election, he talks again about the part that man must play, his believing the gospel. So finally, we have the result of God's choices on those who accept them by faith and those who reject him in unbelief. The Gentiles who did not seek to be righteous became righteous when they placed their faith in God. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. How is it that the Gentiles have attained to righteousness? They exercised faith. Faith in God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this takes us right back to Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In Galatians 3, 6, just as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And James 2, 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. See, that's a pretty important concept. It's mentioned three different places in the New Testament here. But Israel, who thought they could be righteous by keeping the law, relied on their own efforts and they missed the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 31, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They chose not to believe or to exercise faith in God. They tried to work their way into the kingdom. So the end result is we can either be offended by the rock that is Jesus, or we can believe in him and have the shame of our sin removed. Verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And this is what it comes back to for both Jew and Gentile. All have to decide to trust him or not. All have to respond to God in faith. And those who place their trust in him, whoever believes in him and responds to him in faith, he promises that they will never be put to shame. God forces no one to believe by decree or by calling or by choosing or by election. But he does decree and call and choose and elects to save everyone who does come to him in faith. And that should give us great confidence. Let's pray.